Every day, you essentially pay your dues by doing the harder thing when it's the right thing to do. Okay, well, Dave and Jen, thank you so much for taking the time to be on with us today. I think we got some important things to discuss, so thanks for taking the time. Pleasure. Thanks so much for having us. So, um, very important topic that I think we want to go over with you guys. It's kind of the culture that we've seen, obviously... Jen, you coming from the gymnastics world at a very high level. Dave, you have competed in college and still uh, very active within the community through coaching and through a lot of other areas with your PT. PT. Um, I come from the, the world as well. We know what the culture in gymnastics has been for a long time, especially on the women's side. And there's been an, an incredible movement to recognize the challenges that uh, the young women have faced over the years and what can we do to possibly create a future that is safe, healthy, and still successful for the next generation of athletes. I think those are all things that we really want to see. So maybe we can start with you, Jen, and just talk a little bit about your background as an athlete and what you're doing right now to kind of help start this change for the next generation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so my background is all entirely in artistic, women's artistic gymnastics. Um, started when I was six, was in the national team by the time I was nine, and then was competing for Great Britain uh, up until when I was 18. I did the London 2012 Olympic Games. Um, we didn't medal. It was amazing to be a part of, amazing to have the home crowd. Um, yeah, but absolutely, we... that's incredible. <laughs> and at the time it was I think a modern record for the the best Britain had done in the Olympics which has since been beaten amazingly um which I'm glad about uh and then I went on to compete for UCLA um it, which was incredible completely different experience um lots of high fives which <laughs> I love <laughs> um, we don't do as many of them in the UK um but yeah really positive and then um, kind of circle up to the present day and um, the distance between me being competing as a gymnast and now me being kind of just a fan. Um, I didn't go into coaching. I have a <laughs> boring normal person's muggle job. Um, <laughs> and uh, But the difference in that time period has given me a chance to reflect on kind of my experiences and the sport as a whole. And uh, with the release of the film Athlete A this year, which if you haven't seen it, you should definitely check it out. It's super powerful. Um, it's kind of uh, made the community and people like me realize that there's more work to be done on our culture than maybe even we realized, even if we were a part of it. Um, and so over the past, since kind of around summer last year, I've started kind of campaigning and um, helping to raise awareness on what changes need to happen and how we can make the sport the safer place it needs to be and like you said like for the happiness and health but and success of of the athletes so they can be even right. more healthy and successful so um yeah I've kind of gone from competing into kind of that more like um outside the sport but still supporting the sport um role and kind of that that's what I want to keep doing um mm -hmm. this year and beyond excellent well there was something in there that you mentioned that I think is a great starting point for a conversation and you mentioned that you started on the national team at nine years old. And yeah. that's quite shocking. I mean, if you think about any other sport, when do you actually start becoming part of a national team? It definitely doesn't start at nine years old. And that, that leads to a lot of the particular challenges that I think that we're seeing, especially on the women's side. And it's something that Dave, I know you've talked about, and I want to bring up, uh, you know, some of the quotes that you bring up in uh, the film that you've put out recently, A Call for Change. Um, with regards to us thinking that, or the general population with women's gymnastics thinking that preteen girls are best suited for high level success within the sport. And maybe Dave, you can talk about where this mentality came from. I think some of us kind of have an idea of where this started and whether or not that actually has any validity to it. Yeah, absolutely. And I can, I can definitely share this is something I've, I've 
dived deep into the literature on and also kind of dug through the, I guess, the, the cultural norms that we have. And um, if you really look back at like, you know, where this came from, you kind of look at the 80s, 90s era where, you know, it just almost honestly arbitrarily became the metric of success after Nadia Comaneci and some of the other athletes that were very, very young and had um, what was deemed successful in large air quotes at that time. And I think what happens is it's, it's a, a probability of taking correlation and not causation, right? So we had a couple athletes who were extremely successful at a young age and everyone was like, well, looks like this is the way let's copy paste this to the entire model across the entire country. And so that's what happened here in the States, especially in that generation. And so I think, you know, there's two errors there. One is that those athletes, again, were successful, maybe not uh, because of those methods, but despite those methods, whereas they were, they were very talented athletes and they got their way, you know, along the programming um, successfully and people reverse reverse said like, Oh, it must be this method. Right. So that's kind of one error. But two is that I think there was a lot that we didn't see behind the scenes. It was really just the tip of the iceberg because we didn't have the internet and social media and things. So there were a lot of collateral damage pieces that you didn't hear about. So when you look at the metric of success of, you know, a one to 40 ratio of someone who quote makes it versus someone who burns out, someone who gets an injury, someone who's mentally unwell, someone who does not have nearly as a successful career as they want, you start to really scratch your head and wonder if that was, you know, okay for us to do. So it became, you know, this shining star moment. And I think a lot of other countries adopted that from what they saw here in the States and maybe some of the Russian uh, Russian or Eastern Bloc influence there. And it quickly permeated around the culture. So that's where it came from. And this might be some, some unfortunate news, but there's actually zero scientific literature to support what gymnastics does uh, at such a young age. I will say the average age of specialization and some projects that we're working on now is probably around like eight for gymnastics, but in every other sport, it's typically around 14 or 15 where they pick one sport and they go kind of all down that pathway. So I think there's a little bit of wiggle room where you do need a younger ish age uh, for, for gymnastics because it's so challenging. And as a coach, I understand that formally, but what we're doing, is wildly out of step with what the literature says. So there's there's the early specialization that's a problem. There's the um, the true physiological understanding that no athlete pre puberty is at their peak strength or power or maturity to handle these skills. And so you're trying to make an elite athlete in one of the most chaotic time periods of their life, which is puberty, right? Which is growth and development. And so that's also not in line with the scientific literature. And also the biggest thing is, is year round training. And there's no other sport that only trains a single sport, you know, eight to nine, 12 months out of the year competing, and then takes maybe a week or two off. Right. And mm-hmm. then, you know, you know, it says, all right, let's go, let's get back on it. Every sport has a relative off season. So there's mm-hmm. many things that don't really fall in line with the, what we're doing. And it's become so ingrained in our culture that when people tried to speak up about it, they were like, no, nah, no, nah, gymnastics is different. And mm-hmm. I think we're seeing now the ramifications of what those choices we made 20 years ago. Yeah. So there, there was kind of this period where uh, things changed because, you know, 50s, 60s gymnastics, women were of an older age, you know, they were, um, closer to their 20s, competing at a, an older age. And then there was a switch that happened. I think in the documentary, you mentioned kind of the introduction of the, the training methods of the Carolis being kind of an impetus to kind of push this in that direction. And then seeing success with Nadia and then saying, okay, this must be the model that we need to use moving forward. But you also mentioned something in the film that I think was important in terms of why the younger girls were kind of chosen. One being the ability to control them, one being the ability to spot them more easily. Uh, Are these some of the reasons that you envision saying, okay, this is why we think the the coaches want and need that control. And the easiest way to do that is by taking them from a younger age. Maybe Jen, can you mention that being having gone through it yourself? Yeah, Jen first. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's crazy to think when I started gymnastics at age six, that's like considered quite late mm-hmm. <laughs> to start as well. Like the pressure to like be like really good and um, on that elite pathway from like eight, nine years old is like intense. And I think um, it, it definitely needs to change. Um, the, the fact is as well that it's not about, um, we're not saying that gymnasts shouldn't be training when they're three, four, five, six, seven, eight years old. That's going to give them amazing coordination and physical benefits. But it's about the pressure that we're putting on girls mm-hmm. at that age um, and the expectations and the attitudes towards training children is should be different because we're, if we're treating them as adult athletes when they're not adults then uh you know that's never going to work and then if you're just doing it to take advantage of the fact you can more easily control a child then that's clearly not ethical so (laughs) um 
yeah, I mean, there's no questioning kind of that kind of uh, line of thought. And I think the other part of the problem is not just that gymnasts are easier to control, but it's more aesthetically pleasing um, to look. Gymnastics is a sport that surrounds or is based around a lot of handstands and you want a clean vertical line. And if you're, you know, got a little stick thin young girl's body, like the judges may be more inclined to be like, oh, that's a straight line. But coaches shouldn't be going for that aesthetic over like the health of the gymnast. If a gymnast is naturally has that kind of body shape, that's absolutely fine. But there shouldn't be like a restriction if on like stopping that girl from becoming a woman and other types of body shapes being allowed to succeed in a healthy way so yeah. it's kind of a lot of issues intertwined with it I think yeah absolutely Dave anything you wanted to add on top of that yeah I would agree I would think when I look at all these things in, in either consulting with people or thinking about it in our own gym is there's like a technical side of this problem there's a cultural side of this problem on the technical side I think a lot of coaches really truly believe this is the only way to get a foundation of skills for a high level. And one of my really good buddies, Nick Ruddick, is, is someone who says, you know, you do need to, as we all know that we're Jimmy and Chad probably would with them too. You have to put in the work at a young age to get these fundamentals well and do those. But that is a far cry from the crazy level of sports skills they're competing at a young age, like double pikes and stuff like that when they're 12 and 13. And we now have some research that's suggesting that the earlier you start those really hard skills, the higher risk of things down the road may happen in like your later years of college. So um, I think there's the technical piece that we have to get past, which is like, yes, it is definitely important to learn these foundational basics when you're young, but there's many, many ways to learn these things at a young age technically well with a whole bunch of different drills and trampoline and spotting and stuff like that, that you don't have to make them be hard skills. So if people can just get over that myth that you have to, I'm going to miss my shot technically if I don't develop these skills before they go through puberty and it's a harder time to catch up. That's really, there's countless examples of people who have been fine with a later peaking and later specialization age so that's one the other side is cultural where it comes more towards the personal development stuff about like okay why are we doing this is this like a young hot shot that you get to show off and it makes you feel cool mm -hmm. because you're a great coach and you go to this routine you know that you hit this routine and they go, wow she's doing a full at age 12 on vault that's incredible right and it starts to become this little bit of insecurity ego piece and again that's when you really got to check your ego as a coach and be like okay i could possibly have 10 to 15 more years with this 12 year old athlete if we do things well what am I going to do in this decision-making process that affects the next two months, two years, two things like that? You got to think holistically and not just about the next immediate goal. Absolutely. Yeah. What? I'm sorry. Go ahead, John. Oh, the best coaches will do that as well. Like what Dave's talking about, like let's assume that the gymnast is going to have a longer career and they're not going to burn out at age 16 and onto the next gymnast. Cause that's going to affect the way that they, that you coach them in the way that they learn skills. Cause if they, if you're teaching a skill on the basis that they're going to be this exact same body uh, type and weight and not going to change. And it just relies on them being super light. Then you're limiting their future career so much and limiting that athlete's potential um and it's unfair to the gymnasts and unfair to the sport as a whole to just kind of treat these human beings as just disposable like oh we'll just keep going through gymnasts until we you know get mm -hmm. to the one that survives it <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And in the U.S., as we know, that was 100 percent one of the reasons why they allowed success. We could send two Olympic teams right to some to sure. some world, world events. And I think, unfortunately, in the 80s and 90s, we didn't see all the ones who didn't quite make it right because of that, because they were just like, OK, who's next? Who's next? Right. Who's next? Right. That's the problem. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I could go on. I have so many more questions, but uh, I don't want to leave Chad out of this. Even though it's the only non gymnast, uh, but, but Chad, I'll, I'll, I'll let you jump in here and, and I'm sure you got a bunch of questions. Yeah, no, I'm just, I'm just taking it all in. And it's very interesting to be on the outside looking in, of course, being a weightlifter and, and looking into the gymnastics community and, and the culture of it. And, and we're talking a lot about culture today as you got, you guys are going over that and there's so much to culture. And when I compare that to Weightlifting, of course, there's a lot of similarities. There's a lot of similarities through all sports, and there is abuse in all sports, unfortunately, in many different forms. But when I really kind of compare to what I know from the weightlifting world and what has been exposed in gymnastics, that level of abuse has been seemingly more frequent and seemingly in in more forms. And so I wonder, maybe Jen, if if you can touch on some of the reasons why you feel gymnastics in particular is more susceptible to all different forms of, of abuse and all levels of it. 
Yeah, I think um, it's a good question. I think it's partly what we kind of just touched on, um, that gymnasts are a lot younger, so they're kind of easier to manipulate. Um, so it's easy if you are wanting to, you know, unfortunately, most coaches are great, but if you are that kind of person that just wants, is doing it for yourself and your own ego, and you want an athlete that's easy to control, a gymnast is, is young and vulnerable to, you know, just having to, uh, be put in a situation where they have to trust their coach because they're that young and I think it's also because gymnastics is a really dangerous sport um, you have to place a lot of trust and a lot of belief in your coach literally saving your life sometimes and catching you um, and you have to believe every word they say and put your trust in them completely because of the high risk involved um, and that again can you can easily and someone with the wrong intentions could easily take advantage of that and uh you know take it from just um that position of responsibility for keeping the athletes safe to um that level of control that is just like for their own ego for their own um level of, of, of liking the authority of it um and not doing what's best for the gymnast health just doing pushing that gymnast as much as they can because they can um and maybe you know i don't think that even all of these coaches that are doing it are necessarily doing it with the intent to harm, but like they can get away with it again, because the gymnast is young, because the gymnast will trust them. So, and they think that, well, it gets results. So it's fine. It works. So that makes me a good coach. And that's, you know, it's, it's for their benefit. What's the problem. And we need to draw a line between like, just because it gets results with that one person doesn't mean that it's successful <laughs> or that it's okay. Even for that one person. Or what that person looks like after the results. Like what 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 is the person able to do? Like to get to the point of success, what does that person have to endure? And I think sometimes that's lost because we put such an emphasis on the result and not the person who is actually going through it. And I think that's one of the things that we really have to also. It's not just about metal count. It's not just about kind of the end result. It's also the process, right? Yeah. The other thing that's really important too, I think, and Jen kind of talked about is like, there's an inherent knowledge and power dynamic that has happens in gymnastics more than other sports because of the, it's so hard to learn skills and it's, it's the, the age difference of the, the knowledge level is different that a lot of athletes unfortunately get sucked into that kind of power dynamic. And I think a lot of the, an error that I made as a younger coach that I think really people of all sports need to reflect on is as a coach, there's nothing wrong with being excited about results and wanting to get fired up and want to have good competitive success. That's awesome. Right. But if you tie your sense of self-esteem and self-worth to the athlete's performance, you are setting yourself up and the athlete up for a disaster because when they do really well, you're really excited. You're a great coach. You're happy. And when things go wrong, you feel like you're not a good person. And it's really like, that's a dangerous way to live your life. And so if you can, in terms of solutions, if you can detach yourself as a, as a human from the competitive results, the money, the fame, the status, all that stuff that we know is superficial and doesn't really last, and instead care about authentically your relationship as, a, as an inherent partnership towards a common goal and what you can do to help develop that human behind the, the athlete, that's really, really important. And I think the best coaches do that really well. They, they understand win or lose. They still care about the athlete no matter what. And I think that's really where the best competitive results come out because that person is not scared about messing up or scared about, you know, a failed competitive result, knowing that on the back burner of their parents, their, their coach and stuff still care about them. Can, can I uh, expand a little bit on this coaching side? Because I think it's a really important point. Um, the, the difference between fear-based coaching and, you know, a, a coach that is more around the idea of being a positive role model. Um, I think all of us in any sport have probably come across both types of coaches. Uh, but I would like to get, Jen, your perspective um, on coaches that have really done the opposite and what a positive coach does differently to still achieve success. And I think you have probably have a unique situation here because I mean, just from your background, you know, having gone to UCLA, I know Miss Val and Chris Waller and the other coaches at UCLA over the years have done such an incredible job of creating an environment that is positive. And can you speak a little bit more about what, what some of the characteristics are of a coach that kind of instills positivity in a daily training session in a competitive environment? rather than a fear-based coaching type of situation? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I want to go into too many details or <laughs> names, but um, yeah, let's use an example from UCLA. Um, one thing uh, that I really noticed when I was there is that every decision that was made about the 
uh, my routines or what I was going to do that week or at that meet um, was a joint decision. And it was, do you think you can do that? It was mutual respect. It was how far you can go. And because I was involved a lot more, it made me more invested, maybe more motivated, maybe want to perform better than if I'd just been told you have to do this or, you know, we really need you to do this. Um, so that was really positive. Um, another example I can give from uh, UCLA that um, I've given a few times before and seems like nothing, but was like a real like mind blow moment for me was um, in my freshman year, uh, I was uh, sick. I had like a cold or the flu, you know, and uh, season for um, college gymnastics um, starts in January. And it was just before Christmas and I came to the gym and I was really worried about being sick and not being able to do my routines. Um, and uh, I think it was Miss Val just said to me like, oh, I just hope you'll be okay on the plane home because I had like bunged up ears or whatever. Mm -hmm. And that moment, because I thought she was going to finish the sentence with, I just hope like you'll be able to do your routine. So I just hope you'll be good enough by the time you come back from Christmas. And the fact that she just was caring about my health on the plane home, like just blew my mind and made mm -hmm. me realize, wow, like I'm actually, I'm really cared about by this person. And that makes me really want to give back and to be invested in this team and be invested in this relationship and in the results. And it just pays off so much better not just from like my own happiness but like my investment and motivation to want to do even more and offer more and be a part of uh, the team and get better results for myself not just because um, of the pressure or expectation to mm -hmm. what about you Dave I know you you coach as well having gone through it as an athlete and now a coach what do you notice yeah and as someone who's gone from the not great example to hopefully a better example I can tell you uh, it's not a comfortable transmission transition but it's needed um yeah I think the highest performing coaches in terms of what they're able to do competitively but also with their culture is definitely by far in a way they have no gap between what they say and what they do they have high moral fabric they come from a place of integrity but they don't say one thing and then do another and I think a lot of a lot of anybody, you guys are obviously Dave and Chad are parents, as we know, this is like, you know, kids are watching you all the time. They're watching what you're doing. They're watching how you act. And so if you say, I think you guys should be, uh, you know, working hard and you guys should be here and focused, but then you're on your cell phone and you're not taking care of your own health and you're not sleeping and, and you know, taking care of your own personal life. Well, they say that and they don't believe you. So those, the, the non say do gap is really important, but the other most important thing is that they're, they're radically collaborative and they work with a team of people to help get the best information with the athlete in a, in a, a athlete centered model. And that's the era that I think, I think colleges have that to their advantage, thankfully, because of financial constraints or things like that, but they have a nutritionist, they have a mental health provider. They have a, a medical team who is the one who is the, the, the stopping gate between who competes and who doesn't for medical reasons. And um, I think that's really important for people to realize is that even if you're at a club level and you can't have this great staff around you, you should really have a team of people because the six minds of people who are like, you know, a nutritionist spends their entire life studying that science and a, and a strength and conditioning coach spends their entire career studying that kind of stuff. How in the world do you expect yourself to be technically the best person you could be, but also understand nutrition and mental health and deal with parents and then also know a lot about energy systems like and this is something I'm so grateful with from Power Monkeys because in my coaching education, when I first came to camp, I was like, oh, I'm, I'm pretty, you know, I think I got a lot of stuff going here. You know, I went to PT school and I think I'm pretty smart. And then I watched Jay and Chris Hinshaw and I was like, I know nothing about energy systems. I watched people lift weights. I was like, I'm an idiot. I don't know what I'm talking about. You know, I watched like real experts in their craft and I was like, this is wildly important for gymnastics. And I think I wrongfully get credited for the things that I share that I know about those fields. I'm like, I'm just listening to other experts around there, but the best people at the college level or the world level who are successful have that team of people and they're one voice helping the athlete be to where they want to go. And it's not about their own personal agenda. Yeah. And I think an important distinction in here too, that I think I'd like to get everybody's take on yours as well, Chad, from the weightlifting world is the difference between being an abusive coach and being a tough coach, mm. because I think being tough in situations is important and, you know, making sure that the coach has the ability to say, I think you have a little bit more in you and to pull things out of you that you didn't think you were capable of doing. And there's situations where there's that line, right? When, when is, when, when are you going too far? When is being a tough coach, tough, showing tough love important for the development of the athlete? Um, I don't know if there's an easy answer to that, but Jen, from your experience, have you been able to notice a difference between those two? Like, do you, do you have a, a situation where you've noticed being a coach being tough on you is actually beneficial? Um, yeah, I think it can seem like a gray area, but it's actually quite black and white if you look at the wider context and the communication between the coach and the athlete. So um, 
let's take like two examples. So one coach is yelling at the athlete being like, you can do better than that. And then you have the same coach saying the same thing in a different situation. But one of them is based on clear communication all of the time. You know, they they then talk to them later. They say, you know, they reevaluate their goals. They say, is this what you want? Are you okay? If they, they seem to be reacting badly, they stop. You know, they say, I'm doing this for you. The other situation, the coach is yelling, like, you can do better than this. And then if the uh, athlete doesn't respond well, they just persist. They keep shouting. They keep yelling. They don't respond to their emotions. They don't um, appear to care for the way that that person reacts. And they don't follow up with a conversation about what they're looking for or how they're feeling or how they can work better together. And that's a clear distinction i think that it's the same action but it shows a wildly different approach to why they're doing what they're doing and and how they're caring about that athlete um even though it's the same thing is like okay you're, you're shouting at them and it's not so yeah it's it's gonna be a gray area like okay you can't be like just don't shout never shout or like that's not okay because sometimes you do need to like you know a bit of a wake up or a, um you need a tough love or you need um someone to tell you to stop it because it's dangerous for you or something um so it's not strictly about the action involved but it is very clear to see when you look at that context and you look at why coaches are doing the things they're doing um, and I think another important point to make here is that um, it's hugely about um, education as well because I think in both situations those coaches could think they're doing the best thing for their athletes to get the best results um, but the one who doesn't have the, the clear communication and um, doesn't draw off other sources and collaborate with other coaches and specialists, like um, they, they no, realistically, they're not helping that athlete, even if they think they are, they're having a negative impact on that athlete. They're not giving them control. They're not, you know, they're having a long term impact that may become, an, you know, bullying or like emotional abuse. Um, so it's t it, making sure that coaches are aware what that difference is, what it looks like, and um, the reasons for doing what what you're doing when you're a coach, uh, so that they're really clear if they're just copying how they've been coached, um, that they don't just kind of continue to pass on bad methods. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, one of the things that I've always known, I mean, I've had positive and negative coaches, and I never thought that I would get into the coaching world. Uh, but I recognize that my, my last coach was extremely positive, and was able to be tough at the same time. And I, I recognize that it worked because of his investment. His investment to do exactly what you're saying, to ask more questions, uh, to see how I was doing outside of the gym, to like, how, how, you know, how's your hobbies going? You know, how's your art going? How, just to be able to say, I care about you more than what you produce in the competition setting. And that goes a long way in me being able to give feedback to him and say, okay, be honest and say, today, I feel like shit, I can't go, I, you know, I can't do what you're asking me to do. Or him being able to say, I know you're capable of a little bit more today, but it, it comes from the coach's ability to actually invest beyond just what you produce. I think that that's a critical component for the athlete to actually buy in. Chad, have you had any experiences? I know weightlifting is maybe a little different in terms of when you start, you start at a little bit of an older age. Is there anything that you've noticed in terms of positive and negative coaches in your experience? Yeah, for sure. I, I never really came across to any coaches that were just in my face and yelling all the time. It does seem like weightlifting is for the most part, a little bit more uh, laid back. And I myself was a very much a, a self starter. I didn't really need to be motivated or, or, uh, or yelled at or anything else like that. But as a coach, you know, I think some of it is also about being a little bit of a chameleon in, you know, um, molding to the athlete that you're in front of, what do they need to hear how do you need to say that what age are they if they're nine i'm gonna have to say it in a completely different way than um, a master athlete that i'm working with that's 60 year old at 60 year, 60 years old or 30 years older or, or whatever that may be and what type of person is this athlete as well um you know for me it's it's like is is the coach like you guys say, yelling, yelling, yelling all the time. And that's all they ever do to every single person. Well, that's not going to work very well for most people anyways. Maybe there's those few people out there that do. I myself as a coach probably don't yell enough. I'm not real sure, but, um, but I do know we need to pay attention to uh, as we learn our athletes over time. I think that's why it's important to develop those types of personal relationships with athletes. So, you know, their personality more, you know, what's important to them, you know, how they're, 
uh, perceiving words because some athletes are going to perceive words and they're going to find something negative in every single word. And it's going to potentially um, make them overthink and pull them in a negative direction. You have to figure out how you can help them uh, think through that and help them create something positive out of those words that you gave them. Or you're going to have athletes that are easy, athletes that are going to make something positive positive out of anything that you say. Luckily, I think I was, for most of my career, one of those athletes that didn't matter what was said in front of me. I found a way to at least pretend it was positive, you know, and, and I think that athletes do need to get to that extent or do need to get to that to an extent. Um, but it's going to take, I think, a mentor and a coach to recognize those athletes that are turning every, every word or every uh, phrase into maybe something potentially negative and help them uh, learn how to think, think through that, how, how to go through a process of turning that into a positive. Yep. Uh, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with, uh, I think it falls back on this idea of investment from the coaches. Uh, the, the best coaches that I've been around understand that everybody's an individual and everyone deals with you know, criticism and yelling differently. Yep. And if you're just yelling uni universally at everyone exactly the same way, you're going to get a different response from every person on the team. Yep. So you have to care more about each individual. Gymnastics is unique. Weightlifting is unique in that they're individual sports and, you know, the person's individual uh, ability contributes to the team, but it's different than a basketball team where everyone's kind of collectively working together. But um, I think that's a really important point and brings up something else I wanted to, to mention here with regards to specifically women's gymnastics being like we've been talking about uh, the girls being so young when they're getting started that the parents play a much bigger role within this process and that there is kind of this triad between the athlete, the coach, and the parent. And for a long time, and Jen, your experience here again will be uh, important to understand, but is, is it right to say that the parent has played less of a role where you go into the gym, you, you leave your kid and you let the coach do their thing, which I've always been a proponent of in terms of like how I was coached, say like, okay, I want my parents to step away, let my coach do their thing. And then the parents come in afterwards. Um, that seems to work if you have a coach that you can trust and you understand kind of their intention behind it. But how do you envision the coach parent uh, athlete relationship working, especially for girls that are starting out? Yeah, I think that that uh, kind of triad is, is really important, um, especially in gymnastics. Like um, Chab was saying, like some gymnasts will interpret things a lot more negatively or they'll be thinking things in their head, but they're so young, they might not be able to communicate how they're feeling. So if you don't bring the parent in, like how are you going to understand like how best to help that child in certain situations? So that, that's a really important part of the communication. Um, but also like, I don't understand well, it, it, there's a time and a place, like you said, for kind of stepping away and okay, I'm in the sporting world now and I'm going to focus on this. And it's not about like waving to your mom or like, ha like having them watch you. Um, but like at the same time, if they're never involved and then they never know what goes on behind closed doors, like so much could go on that the athlete or the gymnast, young gymnast doesn't realize is even wrong until they're older and later. And mm -hmm. if they don't necessarily then tell their parent or the parents not involved, like, abuse can happen and go unchecked because uh, as a young athlete, you think it's your fault if you're being, you know, told off or bad things are happening. So there needs to be that connect for the safety of the athlete and also to help the athlete with that um, communication. And I think definitely my experience, like it wasn't nearly like connected enough. Like um, when I compare it to my experiences in school, for example, um, it sounds crazy, but like, why would they be so different when I'm learning about um, history or I'm learning like how to write there's like constant communication feedback from my teacher to my parent and like every so often maybe like once a year at least like there's a communication a solid conversation that's happening how are they getting on how can we better help them um, that never happened to me with, with gymnastics there wasn't like a yearly check-in or maybe even more frequently than that would be appropriate as a young child mm -hmm. um, there wasn't like a you know feedback being sent at home and there wasn't even a place in my gym for the majority of my career for parents to watch um, at least when I was a, a little bit older so they were completely out the loop a lot more than they they than could have benefited me um, for my mental and health and career and progression.
Yeah, I'm, I'm very, I'm very it. curious. I, I, I want to just ask a question uh, to add on top of that, because as a parent myself, when I uh, think about some of the abuse, again, of all forms that have, that has happened in gymnastics and some and weightlifting too, but especially with the culture and the way that things typically work, as you said, Dave, you know, usually they're going in and they're training and their parents maybe uh, leave the gym. They're not there at all. They're not uh, around during the, the communication and maybe some sort of abuse starts to happen. Do you guys know of any parents that have, well, any gymnasts that have been in certain situations where they've been abused? And I just, I'm curious to hear how some of the parents are handling some of these issues that they have that their kids have gone through. And, you know, hindsight is 2020. They look back and say, you know, I trusted these people and I maybe should have been involved a little bit more or in a little bit of a different way. And maybe these things wouldn't have happened. And like I said, just as a parent myself, it just makes me wonder and feel for these parents, you know, what are they going through and how are they handling it? Yeah, I mean, I can't speak obviously as a parent, but I can tell you for a fact from I've been uh, fortunately and unfortunately able to see both examples of positive and negative here. And I think there's a very large difference between as a parent being educated and really being completely understanding of everything that's happening in the gym and in their uh, athlete's career. There's a difference between that and then trying to coach the athlete, right? There's a difference between wildly over-informed and very aware of every decision and why it's being made. And I think this goes back to the, the coach athlete relationship, but also the parent coach relationship is like the more open radical communication you can have, and you can make really sound rationales for why you're doing certain things, why you're making training decisions, why we're pushing on this day when I, I know they have more in the tank versus why we're going to, we're going to put it on the shelf until later this week. And also with parents too, why are we doing this meet? Why are we coming more hours? Why do I want them to work on these kind of drills? If you can have that radical open communication, there's no possibility of something being hidden behind the scenes. And so that's the first thing that I would just probably try to offer is like, as a parent, your number one job is to protect your kid at all costs. So if you're, don't be afraid to ask a question and don't be like, oh, they're going to be upset with me if I overstep my bounds and stuff like it's your job and you should know every single thing that's happening in the training planning and why. And if there's no reason why you can't go watch training, like if, if your, your son or daughter is like, oh, I don't like my mom watching you. He's like, well, I'm sorry. I'm still going to watch. Like I'm paying and I'm, mm -hmm. I care about you. So if I'm just hanging in the corner, like casually watching and like, whatever, no big deal. There was a one-way mirror in uh, our viewing library, uh, viewing lobby of our um, gym when I was younger. And I, hated that my mom always came there but I knew she was there she was there all the time watching everything non-stop and she would have awkward conversations and she would ask really awkward questions to my coach sometimes and I was like mom this is so embarrassing mm -hmm. but she was always involved all the time but she never tried to teach me gymnastics she never tried to make a training decision she knew where her line stopped as a parent and my coach's line started as their influence so that would just be my two cents Chad Chad uh I noticed this weekend that Ella had her first competition in weightlifting where mm -hmm. She set a state record for her age group and everything like that. Congratulations, Ella's yeah. badass, following mm -hmm. in her parents' footsteps. But um, how old is she now? Uh, 11 and a half. So she's 11 and a half, and Jody is coaching her, right? Right. So your wife is coaching your daughter, and you're on the sideline being a parent. How is that relationship with you, with your daughter, who's actually participating in sport now that, that you obviously had so much success in? Yeah, I'm definitely more on the sidelines and that's really where I want to be. I want to be that parent as much as I can, especially since Jody is, is her coach. And, um, it's, uh, you know, again, being on the outside of, of their relationship in that regard, I do worry about the future a little bit, you know, is it going to be better for Ella to have a different coach or is this going to work out, um, throughout her entire career, however long she chooses to do it. And that's one of the things that I think has worked with their relationship and with, her doing weightlifting is that we have never for one second pushed her to do weightlifting. We never asked her to do weightlifting. It's something that she saw us do. Um, she picked up a barbell and started mimicking our movement at a very young age. She was doing, making up CrossFit workouts when she was four or five years old. And she still does to this day that I, that I do with her. So it's not something that we had never, ever even asked her to do. Jody said, Hey, I'm going to have this, um, uh, you know, uh, little lift or weightlifting class, do you want to join in on it? Um, you know, or you can join in on it if you want to. And, and she did. Um, and she's been doing that for, for many years now. And, uh, it's, it's awesome to watch though. And, you know, at, at 
this competition and, and she, this is probably her fourth or fifth competition, but, um, you know, sometimes she'll approach me and, uh, she doesn't really ever ask me for pointers or technical advice or anything like that. And actually she hates if I ever even say any hint to anything in that regard. But, you know, one of the things that she did this last one that I thought was very mature and I'm very proud of her for is that she approached me and she just said, dad, I'm really nervous, you know? And so just to be there for her, to have, uh, her to be able to say that and express that and to know that it's okay to say those things and it's okay to be nervous and for me to be able to offer some support and some words from my own experience as a weightlifter and knowing my daughter so well, um, I think it's something that was really beneficial for her. And I'm just getting chills here just thinking about, you know, being able to offer those words to her and be there for her in, in that way and watch this relationship that her and Jody have and um, the maturity that she has at this very young age. And honestly, she really picks her own weights, which is amazing mm. for an 11 year old to know her body and her abilities so well. And, you know, we, we knew that there were records, but we didn't tell her that there were records to get. We didn't tell her until, you know, that she did her second attempt in the clean and jerk and they announced that it was a record and she, her eyes lit up and, and <laughs> were real wide. She had no idea. And we didn't want her to, we didn't want her to have that pressure you know, at this young age. And once she figured out it was, and we then said, Hey, there's another record that you can get. It's the total record. If you do this certain amount of weight and knowing that she's capable of it, we allowed her to make that decision and she wanted to do it. Um, so she called those weights and, uh, I don't know, that's, that's, that's probably me going off on a tangent there, Dave, no, but it's, um, it's, it's, I definitely feel lucky for the situation. Um, and, um, you know, how Jody has molded her, uh, her technique and her as an athlete and her perspective um, and, you know, how we're able to be there and, and support her in those different ways. Yeah. And there's it. a really, there's a really important message out of this, which I think we should all try to listeners and everyone take it. coach athlete parent is that Chad and Jody unconditionally love Ella, no matter what happens in her sport. You know what I mean? I, right. We all know Jody. She's amazing. Even though Jody's her coach, she could have missed six for six and been done nothing. And be like, awesome. Great. Awesome. Good job yeah. out there. You know what I mean? And I think that's a really, really important takeaway that everyone has to understand is you have to get to a place as a coach. And even me as a medical provider, right? There's some times when I really want it for the, the athletes to be successful, but but you have to separate yourself from the need of the athletic performance or the outcome and know there's a human behind there. You mm -hmm. have to empathetically understand that. And so as a parent, as a coach, as a medical provider, it's unconditionally supporting the athlete mm -hmm. as a person, regardless of any competitive positive or negative. Well, and just recognizing too that, well, I mean, because I'm, I was a high level athlete and lifted weights for so long and just understanding there is so much to simply the effort of it, right? Simply to the athletes going out there and trying, being brave enough to sign up for the competition, being brave enough to go out there on the competition platform when in weightlifting, you're the only person out there. And, and for you guys too, you're, uh, you're the only person out there on that apparatus. You're, you're by yourself and you're trying to make something happen. And that's really one of the things that I've told her many times that I'm trying to get her to understand is that Hey, that's awesome that you broke records. Congratulations for going six for six. I am incredibly pr proud of you for that. I'm excited for that, but know that I will be just as proud of you for the effort for you, for you going out there and that, you know, cause she, she's to the point and I understand she's very young and she's probably going to go through this for a while. And I went through this for many, many years myself is being afraid to fail and being afraid of letting other people down. And, you know, my, what I'm, doing my best to do along with all this right now is just getting her to understand this idea of us being there unconditionally, as you said, Tilly, and us being so proud of her um, for nothing other than the effort. And that's it. Mm -hmm. I love that. Can I just add as well? Like, I love that you're sharing your love of the sport with her and you're able to go on this journey, like, and, and have that passion and um, she's able to learn off you without, um, that pressure and I just love all the things that you that you just said and also it's just a great example that um parents being involved with you know as a coach or or alongside a coach like isn't the problem I think for some reason like uh gymnastics at least like 
is used in an, as an excuse a lot that, oh, well, parents, that they shouldn't get involved for them to keep them away because pushy parents is bad. It's bad for the athlete. And like, and they're going to interfere with our coaching knowledge. And like, pushy parents is not the problem. Okay. This is not <laughs> a problem. Parents love their kids. They just want what's best for them. Like, okay, there might be like one parent that's like a little bit too involved. Like, wouldn't you rather have that and parents be super involved in helping the athlete, supporting the athlete, like helping to pass on their passion or their experience formally in the sport um, than have parents not involved and potentially like abuse go unchecked and, and the athlete be upset and not know how to communicate and all these other problems. Like let's choose pushy parents, like, or yeah. not even pushy parents, but just let's involve parents. It's great for them to be in the relationship. I think that's yeah. such a great point. I think that's a great point. And, and I think it also just speaks to what we said before about if you have a coach that's involved at that level too, the coach will probably be able to kind of quell that pushy parent by showing engagement with the parent, you know, initiate conversations with the parents and, and have one-on-one -on -one conversations throughout the year sporadically to give updates and things like that. And that probably would create a better relationship for even those parents that are a little bit kind of wanting to be in the gym and wanting to kind of watch and, and, and see what's going on. So I think that also kind of leads to a better relationship with the coaches involved as well. Yeah, I think we just need to get this message out as well, like because it's it is part of the cultural expectation, at least in gymnastics, that parents aren't involved. Um, and I just want to also add that if you're a parent and your um, child did experience abuse and you're feeling guilty about that and you're feeling like it's your fault, like it's not your fault. There are lots of reasons why parents have been held back or why that has gone unchecked that are cultural and that are part of the problems we're trying to solve. And I think um, at least my parents, they feel quite, you know, like they, what could have they done differently or what didn't they do and um other parents have been saying that but like it's j let's get parents more involved in the long term but also if parents haven't been involved like at least in gymnastics like it's not your fault and we, we also shouldn't be blaming parents if mm -hmm. they're not involved and something doesn't happen because it's it's ultimately it isn't them that caused it um so yes like check in with your athlete like try and be involved if you can but like you're, you're also not to blame if mm -hmm. that happened and um and, and you are the parent in the situation but yeah. like moving forward if we do involve parents more i think that this will help prevent abuse from happening absolutely uh well this is obviously a very complex issue and one that needs to be brought forward much more and I know both of you guys have thought about this quite a bit in terms of some solutions. Do you have any that you'd like to share in terms of some next steps that would be helpful for us to be able to share with our, our listeners? Yep. Do you want to go first? first? <laughs> There's so many things I want to see happen. Um, <laughs> Other than the things, you know, we've talked about, I think just even just talking about this is uh, part of a solution because a lot of it is cultural change, is misconceptions. Um, so yeah, the more we can get these messages out, understand, have everyone understand, coaches, parents and gymnasts, what good and healthy coaching and, and uh, training looks like that is part of a solution. Uh, but then there's also like a lot more like concrete things that we want to see. Um, along with uh, former gymnast Claire Hefford um, and I have founded a, a nonprofit called Gymnast for Change and that's specifically focused on the, the positive future for gymnastics and those solutions and, and making it uh, gymnastics the best place it can be and we have like a number of goals um, everything from I mean it starts with recognition you know recognizing where the problems are we need um, apologies and acknowledgements and compensation for those people that have been wronged so you know kind of need to bring things up to date but then moving forward we need better monitoring um, we'd like uh, reporting systems to be independent and um, we think if governing bodies are kind of keeping themselves accountable it's never going to really work so we would like an independent sports ombudsman in the UK at least um, to kind of be a check and an independent balance there um, and then internationally more widely we're kind of thinking what uh would be an ideal model is something like wada so anti-doping monitors doping and uh and abuse of um of like substances but could there be a similar system set up internationally for monitoring um like coaching styles and abuse of uh of athletes and uh behaviors in a similar way that would be great um another thing that we would like to see um internationally is records being kept more or in cooperation between um countries and making sure that 
individuals who maybe had a record or they um, have you know been shown to be abusive coaches in one country can't then just go to another country and do the same thing mm -hmm. <laughs> because that's just crazy you can't it just unchecked and we have so much transparency and globalization now that it's possible for us to monitor it you know much better and make sure that if coaches are traveling around you know they are checked they are um in the right situation they have the right education and safety protocols for their athletes um so yeah we like to see like an international list for a uh, shared list in gymnastics that uh, monitors that um, I honestly could go on all day about so many <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> solutions that I want to see, but let me give Dave a chance. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's funny because Dave and Chad and I had a podcast previously that we, we talked about and one of like, I have kind of three pillars that are really important for change. One of which is like a moral and ethical standard that's enforced. And this is what you're talking about, which is having a really clear cut guideline of how you interact with kids and what's okay, what's not okay. And actually putting your money when your mouth is either when someone does something that's out of step, but also raising up the positive coaches who are doing an amazing job and saying, Hey, this is what we should follow. Here's some great people to, here's how you deal with conflict in the gym. Here's how you deal with teenagers who have low motivation on a, on a late Wednesday they practice and you're feeling the the emotions boil up here's what you do and here you can handle that so that is one that i firmly believe and I, th I think the second most important thing is, is radically overhauling the educational model we have here in the states and many places abroad it's just it's mind-blowing that you can just walk into a gym and be like i'd like to coach I'm like okay sure here's a class it's like whoa wait a minute that wasn't cool at all like you should need a, a formal one year of training to become a basic gymnastics coach and then another another year of training if you want to work in the higher levels and then you should be required to have continuing education from a bunch of different disciplines from mental health the pedagogy into all sorts of other things about how you teach and learn and stuff and then you know there's experts out there all around the world who we should have international consensus statements how, how much should a level uh, a 10 year old train how many hours per week what should they do what's the best practices the science says what are the best medical things like we need that to really happen and i think that will one give those great coaches more um solutions to their problems i have empathy for those coaches who are like i'm just trying to do the right thing i tried to do that clearly it didn't work and i know it's wrong tell me what to do and help me out because they face a lot of really common problems that are challenging and i think we need to do a a better job of supporting them so that they're not as frustrated so that's kind of two and three is what Dave and I have talked about before is is there needs to be a very uh science-based workload and wellness monitoring um uh toolkit that's specific to gymnastics and that's kind of the research that i'm involved in with tim gabbett and some people is you know if we it's not about using numbers to say you have to train this way but those are the best ways to foster these communications as well how are you feeling hey why is your back all right like how was that training how was it not because if you have a planned reason for why you're pushing or pulling back or not and there's a part of a bigger systematic process for a goal athletes get more buy-in parents are on board you have scientific rationale for what you're doing so i think the first one is kind of more the club level ngb which is what you're talking about is their responsibility education is everyone's responsibility and the third one is more for the the geeks like me and some other people to hopefully give people better tools to work with Definitely. And they feed into each other because the more research that we have, the more we can point to, look, it's proven that this works, that helps education. And then the education, the communication, it all kind of comes together to, you know, to help uh, the sport be and the athletes be as successful as they can be. Yeah, that's my last parting point. And I'll, I'll kind of wrap up here with my thoughts is that like, it's it's wild to me and Dave and you and I have had some crazy talks about this. It's crazy how much better some of the the athletes and the, and the performances could be for long term health, because I have some athletes that I work with that are 15 years old, and they've cumulatively missed two entire calendar years because of different injuries, shin splints, stress fracture, wrist injuries. What could you do with two years back of training? That's incredible. So like, it's not about calling out the negatives and trying to be all as we said, you know, like doom and gloom. It's about like, like it could be so much better, like coaches for sure. Like you can be so much happier. You can love your job. You can be excited about coaching it and not feel this burnt out rut because your problems are always bubbling over and you can't fix things. But like the athletes would be happier. The parents would be happier. You know, it's not about money, but financially the sport can thrive more when more kids are involved and have healthier, longer careers. So it's really coming from a position of, of genuinely like wanting you people to be happier in the sport and loving the sport that we know is so great. And everybody, you know, the rising tide lifts all boats when we clear up some of these really elephant in the room issues yeah well i, I will say one uh, i think they're incredible suggestions and ways for us to move forward here uh dave you're mentioning of the fact that there are a lot of great coaches i think it's so important yes. uh to recognize that there are great people doing great things that we need to kind of take from what they're doing and see if we can do it on a bigger scale uh my, my last question for you guys uh before we get you out of here is just with regards of communication between different ngbs uh and and different countries because what USA Gymnastics is doing and, and what you guys are doing in the UK, are those completely independent or are there ways that we can facilitate 
you know, good strategies to coordinate things together. Because like you're saying, uh, Jen, if a coach leaves a country and goes to another and, and continues to implement the same terrible coaching practices that they were doing where they came from, you know, how do we limit that from, from happening? And are you seeing NGBs potentially working together on figuring out strategies? Uh, we definitely need to see more of that. I think what you're touching on is it really comes down to FIG. Is it kind of the central sure. uh, global body for gymnastics? Like they need to take some responsibility as well. Like, cause ultimately like each country does have their own governing body and their own policies and their own rules and their own systems. Um, and that's always going to be the case, you know, countries have wildly different cultures and setups, but um, we, we do need that central uh, body to, to pull it together and to run certain things to ensure there is that cooperation and coordination um, because gymnasts will travel around the world, coaches will move around the world, you know, it's an international sport. Um, and yeah, the more we can collaborate, the better it is uh, for the athletes, like actual like learning off of each other as well as just like making sure we're safe, but like progressing the sport, the more we can do that, uh, the better. Yeah, I would agree too. And I can definitely say on the, on the medical side, there's been more collaborative efforts between a lot of different people in different countries trying to work on some of these things. But this, as Jen says, it's the responsibility of the FIG to kind of say once for everybody, like, hey, we're going to put the competitive nature on the shelf for just a minute until we can clear up all these issues that are really, really important. Because right now it's still a durability contest and there's so many things that are slipping under the cracks. Let's iron out all these really important details. And then once we know people are having a good experience and there's the best scientific evidence and everybody's on a fair playing field, then we can come back and have the great country versus country success. I view it similar as like a country sometimes puts their differences aside between clubs so everybody can learn the best techniques and everybody can kind of work together. And then once you kind of go up, you get your competitive edge back i think we need that in the sport of gymnastics as a whole for everyone to kind of say okay let's pause for a second and make sure we're dealing with the real issues at a baseline level so this becomes something about sport and it's not something about you know you know a serious issue like abuse because you know you can't take the viewpoint as it's like us versus us it's really us versus the world right now i think the entire world of sports is looking at gymnastics in a, in a microscope under like how we handle this and what we do in this moment to move forward as a positive example for swimming and for wrestling which i know have their own you know uh, headaches with, with these kind of issues so i think we need to kind of all work together and be a shining example of what to do and then once we cl clear some of these things up we can go back to being our you know our, our wild competitive selves yeah well go ahead go ahead jen i was just say I have, a, I have a question for um chad is that we're talking about kind of countries collaborating with each other under the sport of gymnastics but do you think that like different sports could collaborate better because like i don't know how the education system for like coaches and athletes like works maybe in weightlifting compared to like you know swimming or <laughs> athletics or or anything else i wonder if it there are things we could learn from from each other from each other's sports and from different sports better um yeah what do you think about that yeah power monkey, uh, living example yeah, of that absolutely yeah. <laughs> yeah, i was, was going to say power monkey is you know when it comes to technique and movement and 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 training and really trying to develop the best athlete that you can you know that's that's what we should be doing um and that's what we should be doing when it comes to systems and, and ethics and everything else, you know, just within the last, and I think the, the USOC as a whole is probably doing this, correct me if I'm wrong, Dave, but we're, we have to take as coaches now, um, ethics classes and background checks and, uh, tests and, and all these things to, uh, you know, educate us on one, what is right and wrong as simple as that seems, and also how to look out for, uh, potential predators and, and that kind of thing. And so I think if those things aren't happening across the board in all sports, those are the types of things uh, that should, that should be happening. And, you know, that's probably all, all I will say on that, but, and I know we're trying to get out of here, but I did want to bring this back to the parents, if I may briefly, because we have a lot of listeners that are probably parents, of course, and I know that gymnastics is something that the CrossFit community loves. I know that because of CrossFit, there are so many more kids doing weightlifting and gymnastics. And I think with gymnastics, and we touched on this a little bit earlier, this myth that gymnasts, high-level gymnasts have to peak at maybe 16 or whatever that number is. And so maybe on the parent side, there is a rush to get their kids in there and to get them training. Um, at, at a high level. And so Dave, I wondered if you could touch a little bit on, you know, like you said, a lot, pretty much every other sport are the athletes are shown, shown to peak at a, at a, a much higher age. 
So can you touch a little bit on what's the difference in, or is it possible for a, a female gymnast, for example, to peak at age 24 instead of age 16? Um, what does that look like? What are the differences? Is it possible for them to be as good of a gymnast at a little bit of a higher body weight versus a, a lower body weight? What does that look like? And what do parents need to consider in that regard? I mean, yeah. I, I think Dave, yeah, Dave and Jen can answer this, but I mean, look at Simone Biles. I mean, I was just what say, is Sim Simone know. doing? But go ahead, Kelly Dave. Black, Becky Downey. The go Downey is like this, there's plenty of examples. And I didn't know if you meant me, Dave, or Dave, Dave. Yeah. So. Oh, Tilly, yeah. I'm sorry, sure. sorry. Tilly, yes. <laughs> Um, yeah. So as we talked about kind of bringing it full circle is, uh, I think now we know, and this has been around for a while, the literature from the Canadian model of long-term athletic development says that no 14 year old female is at their peak strength, power, uh, mental maturity to handle these things. And I think that's the first foundation you have to lay your, your kind of like your, your hand on is make sure you're coming from a solid base of science. And so we know that if we take care of kids when they're younger, that when they get older, they're actually more, much more better prepared to, uh, do well in the sport, let alone survive the sport forces. So that's really important to rest on. But with that being said, I think a, a, a really big elephant in the room here comes the college question here in the States too, which is a lot of athletes are feeling the pressure to get that 12, 13 year old, uh, you know, start because they want to get recruited by, you know, 14 mm -hmm. or 15 years old. And that right. is a two hour podcast in itself, but that's, that's, mm -hmm. the, that's the NCAA needing to police better of, of finding people who are recruiting 12 year old elite gymnasts and stuff like that. So if you put that conversation on a shelf, there's millions of examples of people that are doing not only uh, better, but they're in their peak actually later in their career. So uh, like we said, Ellie Black, Becky Downey, people who have you know done things for so many years. Ellie Black's been weightlifting for 10 years with her strength coach, Scott Wilgris, and she's doing incredible, right? Like there's many, many people who are positive examples. And so as a parent's point of view, what you have to do is be able to think about what's the long-term goal here. What's the, what's the end result we want? One is we want a healthy kid on the other side of this, but mm -hmm. two is that Maybe they do have a super lofty high level goal. Well, the research supports, uh, don't push the training hours too much when they're young, do a bunch of things when you're little, get a good wide base of sports, and mm -hmm. then take some off season time after your competitive events and just be a kid and have fun because that's how you develop as the best human, but also as the best athlete profile. And then once you're like 13, 14, 15, you say like, okay, do we still want these high level goals? Like, cause when you were 12, you watched the Olympics and you loved it on TV, but you're 16 now. And it's like, what's going on? Like, is if it's the same goal? Okay. Now let's have a conversation about how do we put all these chess pieces in place to have the right physio, the right strength and conditioning, the right mental health stuff, the right nutrition, the right technical coach. And how do we all kind of move about this piece uphill toward your goals? And I think that's really, I, I can't wait to see the day when we see, I think the average world age was like around like 18 or 19 uh, in the last couple of world cycles, which is really promising. It's no longer 13, 14, 15. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, here we go. And then 16, everyone's at worlds or at that. Mm -hmm we talked about it, but there's a very big need to have a hard conversation about the age limits around when we let juniors compete, when we let right. seniors compete. And then we have these guidelines about, okay, how many hours should a 10 year old do? What does it look like? And what are the age specific guidelines? So that, that's a big uh, further conversation, but one, it can happen Two, all the science supports it. And it just three takes a really good team of people who know the athlete long-term is what they want to, they want to work towards. And, and what, what are a few of the things that an athlete uh, or just the human being in general is going to be missing if they do start gymnastics at, Jen, yeah. what'd you say, four years old? I mean, yeah. you know, <laughs> what, you know, if you start at, at a very young age, which, you know, maybe not be wrong, especially if they're doing other sports, as you say, Tilly, but what if they just do weightlifting? They're specializing from a very, very young age and with the general uh, gymnastics program, the way that most people probably still run it. What are a few of the things that they're going to be missing? Yeah. One is a childhood. So that's probably the most important. <laughs> um, but right. in terms of the actual nitty gritty of the science, it, it's, you miss out on a, on a broad range of movement skills, a, a broad range of athletic abilities that, you know, people make the argument that gymnastics is so widespread in the movements they do, but it's still a very repetitive sport, right? So by playing soccer and by playing football or weightlifting or doing something else before the age of 10, and then specializing later, you're giving somebody, you know, a broader base to make a higher peak. And that's what we want. If you funnel someone only in gymnastics or only baseball, they have a smaller base and their peak, their maximal athletic athletic talent ceiling is lower because they don't have all these wide, you know, athletic things to work through. So one is the physiological, two is the strength and three is just the emotional and mental, you know, bandwidth to, to have different abilities to think through problems and stuff. So there's a lot of stuff in that research that's, that's saying you're actually chopping out the potential of the athlete by saying right. only gymnastics year round from a young age. 
Does this explain why me and my gymnastics friends are terrible at ball sports? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Same here. But I'm better yeah, on no, I, than I am on a, a shooting regular <laughs> basketball. <laughs> but there's so many sports I never even did as a child, like, like, or, or still to this day have never even tried because I wasn't in school doing PE mm-hmm. lessons because I got out of PE because, oh, I was doing enough physical education in the gym. And, you know, my parents luckily really pushed me to like keep doing, like to make sure I was like in education as much as I could be. They made me like and my dad made me take swimming lessons because he was like if you're ever on a boat you need to be able to swim <laughs> till he made me get my 400 meter badge um and then uh I did piano lessons so my parents were very much like focused on trying to make sure that I had like a holistic um experience but definitely I missed out on so much in my childhood because I was doing so much gymnastics probably more than I ever needed to be so many hours and not just hours in the gym but hours in physio hours in the car there and back you know not socializing not in school not gaining other skills for my life that uh, could have benefited me and it just was completely unnecessary because I had I not done that I could have had a you know a longer learned more you know been a, a more holistic person early, <laughs> earlier on what skills might I have now that I don't have you know um, but also like I could have had a, a longer career it, it, it's absolutely possible as as uh, Dave Tilly said like you know we've got Oksana Chusevitina is going to I think her seventh or eighth Olympics she's like over 40 years mm. old she's incredible you know and as he said like people like Becky Downey here in the UK um, I don't know the exact numbers but she's posted before about how she's you know heavier than she was in certain uh previous olympic cycles but she's the fittest and healthiest that she's ever been and she's you know at the top of her game and so it can be done you know you you don't have to be a a child prodigy at six years old or or anything like that you know we should be supporting um you know longer healthier careers it's absolutely possible as Dave also said the age is going up so the more we can have this like extended education and cultural education like you're doing in weightlifting like these checks and not have it just be like a grudging checkbox but be something that people engage with and like realize is beneficial for the athletes long term and the people long term uh then yeah we're headed in the right direction at least yeah and, and coaches have to let go of the fear of them leaving the sport i mean, that's my last time in the podcast is so i read this in research studies actually a couple of days ago a lot of coaches want to have them specialize early in only gymnastics because mm-hmm. they're scared they're going to try other sports and they're going to love swimming or love horseback mm-hmm. riding or love piano and they're going to leave and like Ooh, man, that's a, that's a dice roll. What are you doing mm-hmm. to that? And, you know, you're taking them out from their favorite thing. And I've had that as a coach too. Like we had one of our best, you know, young superstar athletes. She was like, I like skiing. And we're like, okay, have fun. We love you. Come back when you're, when you want to hang out. And it's like, you can't hang on to that athlete and, and hold them back from the fear of wanting to do something else. And sometimes gymnastics just, you know, that's not their thing when they're 16 anymore and you got to let them go. Right. That's why I really like the, uh, the motto of USA gymnastics of begin here, go anywhere. Yep. Mm. It's not about achieving high level success in gymnastics, it's about setting a foundation and then going on to do whatever you feel like is your passion. Yep. So um, you did bring up Oksana Chuzavitna. If you do not know who she is, legend, you should look her up. She is on her way to competing in her eighth Olympic Games uh, this mm. summer. She's been every Olympic since 92. She's amazing. She's 45, going to be 46. She's a mom. She is absolutely just uh, a legend in the sport of gymnastics. But um, I think we'll, we will be finishing up here, guys. Thank you so much for the time. I will not ask you the question that we normally <laughs> no, no, ask no. because I think it's unfortunate uh, for Chad in this particular situation. Yes. Uh, but I do want to ask if there's any particular guests that you think would be great for us to have on, maybe to continue this conversation, maybe one from each of you. Jen, go ahead. Oh, wow. There's so many people that have been uh, really supporting like this movement from the start. There's, um, I mean, other other gymnasts who are still going today, like the Downey sisters and um, Tanisha mm. Francis and Hannah Whelan, who've been really like helping drive the conversation. Um, Niall Wilson, who just retired. Um, and then, yeah, coaches who are leading the way as well. Like we mentioned Simone Biles before, like literally the greatest of all time. Her coach, Amy Borman, has really been like a huge advocate um, of like positive coaching and clearly it, it works. <laughs> um, so they'd be great people. Obviously, I've co-founded Gymnast for Change with um, Claire Hefford. Um, so she's been a driving force in the UK for uh, driving policy change and cultural change with me. Um, but yeah, there's so many people that, and, and it's, I'm so glad there's so many people that I can't name them all because this is really needs to be a, a, a group effort <laughs> to change things for good. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah Dave, I would anybody say, else? 
Yeah, I, I really want to have like, whether it's on this podcast or mine or elsewhere, or just like a dream team of interdisciplinary international panel of like those athletes that are in their 20s. Like, I'd love to get like Becky and Ellie and someone from the US and someone like Mez from Australia and just have like a really open, honest discussion with all these athletes that are in their 25 to 30s. And they're like, really, they're looking back on all of it. I would really, really love to dig into their experiences and have an honest conversation about what was good, what was bad, what should we change and their ex- and what they've gone through, because I think that will inform a lot of what's going to happen uh, when policy changes is in the next year fantastic awesome so yeah dave if you're uh dave Dranty, if you're ready i think we can we can wrap it up with that absolutely absolutely cool. well guys tilly jen we really appreciate you coming on it was a great conversation i i learned a ton and i know that the listeners are going to get a lot out of that i particularly like it for from the parents perspective and give them some things to think about and uh, you know they don't have to do certain things or or push them into it, um, you know, be involved at the right level and, and all that kind of thing. Before we get off here, do either one of you have any other parting words, anything coming up that you want folks to know about? I just say thank you for all you guys and the, and the help you guys have given me and, and the exposure. I think that I wouldn't be anywhere without the two of you and Power Monkey and stuff. So I just say thanks. Thank you, Dave. Yes. And thank uh, you, Dave. give a shout out to your documentary one more time. Can you? Oh, yeah. Just- it's not, I have to say, Sarah Thurkle, if you're listening to this girl, you are the prodigy filmmaker at 18 years old. She crushed the first thing she did for 18 shit. years old. Really? Wow. Yeah, she dominated. So uh, A Call for Change was her first short film, which was inspired by the podcast that Claire and I and uh, Jen did earlier. So it'll be the first in a series of probably five to six short films we do about here's the problem. Here's what you do. Here are the most common things we get asked about. Let's make some things to help you guys out. Awesome. Amazing. I'll also just add, thanks so much for having me on. Like I said, kind of a bit earlier, like part of uh, the way to changing things is talking about it, is making sure that people understand what's not right and what is right and having these conversations. So um, thanks for helping us get the message out, me get the message out. Um, Like I said, I launched uh, Gymnasts for Change. um, So you can check out gymnastsforchange.com, which is a nonprofit based in the UK, but we want to help the sport internationally be the best sport it can be. Um, and just to emphasize again that like the majority of people who are in the sport want the best for the athletes they're good people um, and we just want to make sure that that's the case for all all people in the sport and make sure it's a good experience for everyone awesome well guys as always be sure to head over to powermonkeyfitness.com for services and upcoming events and dave i wondered real quick if we could throw in any updates there might be on power monkey camp online Going Absolutely. On Power Monkey Camp Online is now available. Uh, you can go to academy.powermonkeyfitness.com to find out more information. It's an incredible online platform. If you have not been to camp or if you have been to camp, 23 hours plus of information right at your fingertips to learn from our coaches. There are tests, there are certifications that come along with it. Highly recommend checking it out on our website. Again, it's academy.powermonkeyfitness.com. There you go. Please check that out. Please get involved. Uh, Take that opportunity that there is for you guys to see this stuff online and uh, further your education for yourself as an athlete and and as a coach as well. And on behalf of Power Monkey Fitness, we're your host. I'm Chad Vaughn with Dave Durante. And until next time, guys, thank you all for listening.